Hello, welcome to the Crownsman Show. I'm your host, Jared Downey. It's going to be a very interesting show. We're going to be discussing, and I want to get this right, significant changes to be aware of for capital deployment in Alberta in 2021. Now, obviously, there's going to be a there's going to be some energy focus on the show, but I, I think it's going to apply to across Canada, of course. So that's why this is going to be a feature on the Crownsman Show. On the show today, we're featuring MNP. We've got, let me get this right, um, Edward Olson. He is MNP's national lead for ESG, and Jermaine uh, Conacher. I, I knew. I, sorry, Jermaine, when you come on, um, I knew your name and then I screwed it up. Jermaine Conacher is the national lead of the duty to consult practice at MNP. So usually, I just sort of jump into it, but I actually want to read off sort of an intro of what we're going to discuss. And then we're going to jump into the advertising. So uh, last summer, the Alberta government released uh, Alberta's recovery plan to create jobs, build capital and diversity and diversify the economy. Key elements of this plan included creating jobs and investing in energy and infrastructure. This plan is well underway, but also requires private industry, including the energy industry, to invest right along with government. But the investment and capital build environment is changing rapidly. Don't we all know that? And significantly. So today, I have MMP on to sort of unpack it. We're going to co- cover environmental legislation and regulation, industrial uh, indigenous consultation, and ESG, uh, and the connection to raising capital. Before we do that, I'm going to hand it over to Gaudi for the sponsors, and then we're going to jump into the interview. Alrighty, so today we've got Savannah Equipment. Did you know that Savannah Equipment is an electrical supplier in both Canada and the United States? Their electrical inventory includes breakers, disconnects, TEFC electric motors, starters, tech cable, cab tire, motor control centers, and transformers. For your new and refurbished refurbished electrical equipment, visit SavannahEquipment.com, where you will find more equipment every day. Next up, we also have Solar Set. Introducing the new Solar Set Fold, the new foldable frame solar system brings power to your residential and commercial property and can be shipped worldwide. Like all Solar Set products, the Solar Set Fold comes turnkey, pre assembled, and is easily transported and installed. You can learn more about the Solar Set Fold and their full line of amazing solar systems at SolarSet. Dot com. And of course, we've got Power Zone Equipment. When you need a specialized team of world class engineers for your oil, for your oil and gas pipelines to watering or any fluid handling needs, you want to visit powerzone.com. In addition to their inventory of rebuilt pumps, motors, engines, they also have an amazing team to design and engineer your systems, no matter the challenge, no matter the location. Get in the zone with PowerZone. Visit them at powerzone.com. Okay. Thank you very much, Gowdy. Welcome to the show, Edward. Welcome, Jermaine. Good to have you on the show. Jermaine, I, my apologies for uh, screwing up your name <laughs> to kick off the show, but it's uh, good to have you both on. Thank you. Thanks, Jared. Um, okay. We're going to jump right into it. Um, we're going to kind of section out the show um, between um, sort of your both your specialty. So maybe, uh, Edward, we'll start with you. Where do you specialize um, at m and And then Jermaine, we'll jump over to you. Just sort of a, a couple minutes from both of you to sort of to kick off the interview. Yeah, thanks, Jared. Appreciate that. Um, like you said, I'm, I lead the sustainability practice here at MMP, and I've been involved in all aspects of sustainability over the last 20 years. This is everything from environmental audits, uh, helping to design environmental management system that morphed into measuring and assessing carbon credits for trading. And I've even been responsible for the strategy and operations related to running an alternative energy company. So for me, it's what we see today and the translation of all of these trends on uh, companies and their ability to operate and their ability to access capital. Looking forward to getting into more of that content with you uh, as this as this interview continues. Well, I, I one thing I'll say is I, I appreciate you've sort of lined, uh, you've outlined um, your team has sort of outlined what we're going to be discussing today because it's it's a it's an easy topic to sort of get off track and sort of but you've sort of built it in so that we can get through it and give the information that it is important. Um, and and Jermaine, I'm going to jump it over to you. Sort of where where are you coming from for this interview? Yeah, thanks. 
Um, so as you mentioned, I, I lead our duty to consult practice for MNP. Um, it's a national practice, so we work across Canada as the duty to consult is a, a factor in resource development across the country. Um, and essentially it's it's premised on the idea of Indigenous engagement in projects. Uh, but the duty to consult is, is very specific in that there's legislative requirements mm. uh, that flow from unique rights that Indigenous peoples have, which are constitutionally protected. And we can talk about that as we move through the show today, but um, it, it is something that affects all resource development projects. And the duty to consult is triggered whenever a government makes a decision that could potentially impact uh, those rights held by Indigenous peoples. If you're if, if you're just coming on, I'm going to stay with you. We're going to talk about the duty to consult. Um, if you're talking to someone who's really new to the subject, um, how do you sort of outline sort of the key points in it? Is it is it regulatory and then and, and all these sort of where it spins off from? How do you sort of outline it to somebody? Yeah, so it is regulatory, but a lot of the direction does come from case law. Um, but but to back up just a little bit, um, it, it really is premised on the idea that um, Indigenous peoples in Canada have rights that are constitutionally protected. And you'll hear those referred to as Aboriginal and treaty rights, sometimes as Section 35 rights. And what that means is... Um, Canada has a treaty relationship with Indigenous peoples that's premised on sharing the lands and resources. And so the rights that Indigenous peoples have in this country are the rights to subsist um, off of the lands, water and environment. And so any project uh, that happens in the country that can impact lands, water, environment, air, uh, likely triggers a duty to consult. And that duty to consult can be um, variable, bigger, smaller, depending on the size and scope of a particular project. Uh, but it typically plays out in the regulatory process because the regulatory process is designed already to assess the size and scope of project impacts, um, as well as provide a decision by a regulator on whether or not that project can proceed. So the, the trigger for the duty to consult comes from that potential to impact those unique rights, um, but it is typically woven into the regulatory process. So that's why we see it come up time and time again in natural resource development projects. We hear about it when new environmental legislation is passed. Okay, can we can we do a little bit of distinction between the, so regular regulations are always changing and getting updated. That's part of the reason we're doing the show today. And then there's the constitutional side. So. Yeah. It, uh, sort of what you're saying is there's those, those are kind of two separate streams um, that you have to understand. Is that right? Uh, somewhat. So if you think of the constitutional piece as uh, really broad, so what's in the constitution just says um, the existing Aboriginal and treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada are hereby recognized and affirmed. So they exist, they're protected. Um, it, the Constitution also says who the Aboriginal peoples of Canada are, so the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people, but that's really broad. And so how it, it's kind of made it from being in the Constitution to being in regulations, which, as you say, change all the time, is Indigenous peoples have challenged government decisions uh, for the last uh, you know, many, many years, saying that those decisions aren't upholding um, the protection of their rights. And so once the courts make a decision, then it sort of comes down to um, government to enact um, and take the direction of the courts and, and move it into law and move it into legislation. Right. So where in the regulation side, where are sort of some of these trends, changes, you know, sort of some standout points that, that we should cover here uh, when we're talking uh, about duty to consult? Yeah, so you'll you'll see as you know when different jurisdictions, either federal or provincial jurisdictions, are uh, renewing environmental legislation or impact assessment legislation, they're they're taking direction from from the courts and they're sort of trying to keep pace with those court decisions. Mm -hmm. I would say the the court decisions are typically ahead of the legislation and regulations because right. they're happening all the time. Um, but a, an interesting place to look is the new Impact Assessment Act, which is Canada's, the federal government's, a new legislation that replaced the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act uh, that was in place since 2012. So now we have the Impact Assessment Act, and it specifically asks for project proponents 
to assess what the impacts are on Indigenous rights from their project activities. Uh, and that's something that's replaced uh, the old legislation, which was more about traditional land and resource use. So they've, they've evolved their understanding and what they're asking proponents to do um, in their regulations. So what about, I mean, in all of these things, and which is um, obviously where you're where you come into play for these companies, um, you're, there's sort of these benefits and there's challenges and it's always going to sort of be one or the other. Can you sort of outline those and unpack them for us a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I think sometimes uh, where we see um, project proponents have challenges is understanding and keeping pace with some of the changes in the expectations. And so um, like I said, the, the courts are often ahead of where Sometimes legislation and regulations are um, depending on the jurisdiction. And so there are occasions where um, Indigenous peoples, Indigenous groups involved in a duty to consult process will have expectations that are perhaps different than what a project proponent might think is required of them. Um, so I would always advise proponents to look to recent court decisions. Sometimes there's a requirement to go above and beyond what's um, in the legislation, that might be the bare minimum. You might need to do more. Um, the duty to consult is is held uh, by the crown, by the government. Mm. So if if let's say um, an indigenous nation does challenge uh, the approval of a project, they're challenging the government decision. But at the end of the day, um, it's the proponent's project that is either uh, delayed or at risk. And so it is in the interest of proponents to um, build strong relationships, um, engage early, engage often, um, sometimes do more than, than what they're being asked to do by the government. When you see success coming from business, is that, it, from a lot of the shows that I've done, it seems to be there's the major key is to engage early. Have the conversation before you do your press releases and say what the plan is. And then, so this indigenous group is, <laughs> they're reading about it in the news and then you show up the next day <laughs> to talk yeah. about it after you've already told the public what you're doing. Um, I mean, in any negotiation, that's usually a terrible strategy. So that, that seems to be, that must be a major thing that you're trying to communicate to people to, to do it before you start talking publicly. Absolutely. I would, I would, Agree with that. And interestingly, the new um, federal legislation, the new Impact Assessment Act, actually has built in a pre, um, pre-disclosure engagement phase into oh. their major project approvals. So there, if you trigger federal approvals, which only certain projects will, um, you, you'll be required to do it um, as part of due process and for that type of, of project. So it is good practice and it absolutely is something that we would always recommend. I, I think the other um, important piece is also to look at um, the Indigenous nations that are potentially affected by projects as potential partners in those projects. Yep. Um, so we're seeing a lot of and nations that want to invest in projects and want mm. to be part of the benefits that are um, coming out of those projects. You know, you, you kind of made me think of something that uh, it's sort of, um, and sometimes it's a it's a personal area. You sort of go to the negative side of legislation and sort of the challenges of it. But I guess also, they're also putting into legislation, like you say, that that sort of pre-process that the companies should do. When they start to see that that works, they're also putting that into legislation and into the regulatory side of things so that companies actually have a, a, a better blueprint forward because they might not be purposely doing something wrong in the process, but if it's actually legislated in, now they know the steps that they can follow. I guess that's the upside that there is as well, right? Yeah, I mean, proponents like certainty, right? Mm -hmm. Certainty in process um, and, you know, doing some of these things does, you know, maybe doesn't have, you'll never have a certain outcome, but it can build um, some more certainty in terms of what that process and what those timelines might look like. Jermaine, would we be able to, do you have some sort of examples to sort of walk us through or, or sort of showcase an example of this kind of coming together in sort of a real world scenario that we could look at? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's numerous examples um, 
currently, and it would probably almost be challenging to find a major resource development project right now that wasn't an example of, of this right. in some <laughs> fashion, true. to be honest. Um, all, all major projects have um, an Indigenous consultation requirements. So there isn't one that doesn't. Um, some you'll hear more about. Often there's a lot of discourse or things make it in the news and um, maybe everyone doesn't understand the context around it. So you'll hear um, over the last couple of years a lot around Trans Mountain, coastal gas link. So there's a lot of major pipeline projects that oh. uh, this issue comes up. Uh, recently, we've been watching developments um, in Alberta around mining. Yeah. So there have been some recent decisions around coal mining in the province of Alberta, um, and, and particularly ones that are um, do have uh, federal involvement. And so Grassy Mountains, one that people may have heard of because it was not approved, which doesn't happen very often. Um, I mean, most of the projects that do make it all the way through the regulatory process are typically approved, not always, but they often um, do end up in project approval. So the Grassy Mountain project um, wasn't approved and it wasn't approved. One of the deciding factors was that the impact to Indigenous rights was too great. So that's a um, thing that you don't see all that often um, and did happen recently. And interestingly enough, um, that project did have uh, signed impact benefit agreements with some of uh, the First Nations that were potentially affected by it. Not all, but some of them. And so it's it's become a bit of a divisive project whereby uh, there are First Nations that support it and, and there are First right. Nations that don't support it. And the, the federal government did reject that uh, project. So... Uh... What is the process, though? I, I kind of want to get a, you know, I, I don't know how familiar firsthand you are with the project, but what, I mean, how long did that project take before uh, of trying to get it through, get it get, before, it, was it automatically triggered up towards the federal? I don't quite understand the whole setup. Does that, when they say we want that project, just the scope of it and the scale, does it automatically become federal? Um, like, w could you just walk us through the process? Sure. So um, uh, even under the old federal legislation, which was um, kind of shorthand CIA 2012 or the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act, and now the Impact Assessment Act, there have always been um, federal triggers, let's call them, built into that process. So if projects kind of trigger certain things, there will they can go into a federal process. And some of those examples might be um, just projects of a certain size, so emissions that are of a certain scale, things that cross provincial borders, uh, things that cross uh, national borders, um, things that have the potential to affect areas of federal jurisdiction, so on federal lands, um, impacting of navigable waters. So those types of things where the feds have jurisdiction over, um, if a project potentially impacts those things, then there are some federal triggers. So some of these mining projects, or you see, used to see it in the oil sands when there were really large um, open yeah. pit oil sands mining, they'll have federal federal triggers because of the size and scope of the project so where do where does mnp come in i mean obviously you're you know you're being featured on the show and uh it's a pretty shameless plug but that that's okay because <laughs> i'm i'm legitimately asking the setup of yeah. where mnp i mean you're a major player um in your industry uh so i i want to understand for for people listening, at what point is MNP? What what are you, what are you offering, and at what point should uh, companies be engaging with you? Yeah. So I, interestingly, I mean, I think um, you know the public perception of MNP is typically um, an accounting firm, uh, which is absolutely something that MNP does. But we also do consulting work, and that's where um, Ed and I sit and and play in the MNP world is in our consulting services. And yep. so we provide those services. Um, in my particular uh, field, we work for um, either uh, indigenous governments, um, public governments or uh, resource development proponents, um, anyone who's involved in the duty to consult process. We have to be careful that we're only working for one of those parties in the duty to consult process, obviously, or, or right. we're in conflict. Um, but essentially the services we provide are, um, you know, advising clients on how to manage their risk, how to run a good engagement process, um, how to uh, assess impacts to indigenous rights from a project. 
So how does it work? Do a lot of time they would have their own people so uh, that are are doing some of what you're doing as well. So are you sort of a a third party that sort of the idea is that you're coming in to be impartial to sort of give them a clear sort of clear path forward because or or how to, how is that working or are you a lot of times filling in a gap that they do not have at their company? Um, so yeah, so we'd be a third party. Occasionally we do fill, fill a gap that a client may not have internally, depending on their existing capacity. Um, we're never, we don't really play a, a mediator role. We, we would work for a specific client because at the end of the day, most of these projects do go to hearing. And so we're sort of representing or um, supporting the, the client that we work for. Um, so we don't, we don't play like a facilitation or a mediation role. Um, right. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. And my next question is, um, can I be a fly on the wall to some of that consultation? <laughs> so so some of it is done, obviously, um, sort of bilaterally between kind of the Indigenous group and the company. Um, yeah. But interestingly, you know, some where it does play out in the public sphere is when things go to hearing. Um, and a lot of projects do go to hearing. So a lot of the projects um, that are under the Canadian Energy Regulator uh, do have a hearing process built in. And yeah. those hearing processes processes are available. You can tune in and listen when one is happening. A lot of pipeline projects are regulated by the Canadian Energy Regulator, so you can listen to those uh, transmission projects um, as well. So, so that's kind of where you can sort of listen to um, the evidence that's being put forward by a whole bunch of different parties uh, who have an interest in these projects. I was wondering, when you're saying about that, when it is going to a hearing, is that because there is, a, this might be a bit of a dumb question, but is is it because there is a conflict or because they just want it to be resolved through that system? Does it ever just go, we're not really sure how this should go, so we're going to, or is it always because of based on a, on a, like a clear conflict of two opposing positions? It depends. So depending on the jurisdiction and the process that's laid out. So some processes have a, a hearing built into them as part of due process. So they're going to have a hearing. There will be people who are interveners um, on the project and will come to say, we support this. We don't support this. We have concerns about this. And it's just it's just a part of their process. Um, but in other cases, sometimes a hearing can be triggered because of conflict. Right. So you can start a process where there's, um, you know, documents are going to be reviewed. They're going to be put on the record. Um, but if it becomes quite contentious, the regulator may choose um, to put it to hearing or they may get asked to go to hearing by a number of interveners and respond to that and say, OK, well, we'll have a hearing to um, put this before a panel. But if we hear a hearing, we don't need to not just automatically assume that, oh, this is a conflict, that this is all negative, that it, it could just be that that's the process that's, that's most beneficial to it. Absolutely. And it gives um, not just Indigenous groups, but um, anyone who has uh, is potentially directly affected by projects, um, the ability to have a say to the panel. And like I said, an intervener doesn't even necessarily mean it's in conflict. You can have interveners who are intervening on behalf of a project. It's it's very interesting. And I think I need about another hour of uh, of questions. <laughs> so, but, uh, but I don't want to forget about Ed. So Ed, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to thank you, Jermaine. And uh, I'm going to jump it over to you know, two Thank you for giving me like two massive topics to cover on this show, by the way. <laughs> so now we're going to go this simple one of, e, uh, of ESG. Um, <laughs> so thank you for coming on. Um, let's talk about the concept of ESG because it's one, I think it comes up every second show, but it's just, it's such a big topic. I end up covering a segment. It's like, I'll cover the social, a sub segment of social. So it just, can you give us like the macro version of ESG? Yeah, Jared, here, here's how I'm going to boil it down for you if I could. ESG is a cluster of non-financial factors that have a financial impact. Right. There you go. And you're going to say, well, what does that mean to me? Well, if we pull apart a couple of these pillars and I can give you some more of the details behind it, the environmental, the E pillar itself, it considers how companies use energy and, and how they manage their environmental impact as stewards of the planet. 
The E itself considers how a company uses resource across the board and everything that they do. And this is where you kind of hear the idea of scope one, two, and three emissions. Well, this is everything that's direct to you, everything that's indirect through consumed energy, everything that's within your supply chain and what you consume as well. So this is energy efficiency, climate change, carbon emissions, biodiversity, air and water quality. So you can start seeing the alignment between what Germain was already talking about in the duty to consult around natural resources, air and water, and how ESG plays directly into it as well. The S pillar, if I could, this is the one that examines how a company fosters its, its people and culture and, and how that is, in essence ripples across the broader community itself. So it's starting to cover off a bunch of stakeholders that surround where you do business, which is why the whole idea of establishing your boundary is really critical. Factors here are inclusivity, um, um, gender and diversity, employee engagement. It, it covers this plethora of topics within social and many of those social issues become industry agnostic. Every organization needs to address that. When we get down to the governance side, this is really the company's internal system. This is um, controls, practices, procedures, how the organization stays ahead of uh, violations. Um, it, it ensures transparency and in industry best practices. It includes dialogue with regulators. It factors uh, the company's leadership itself, board composition, and so on. So all of that comes together in this really tight package of ESG and, and what I'm really focused on now is, is helping organizations know you don't have to address everything, but there are key or material topics that you need to address as an organization. How do you identify them? Don't boil the ocean trying to address every one of them. And how do you ensure you're not selecting that which you think is most important? It's really important to sit back and say, who are those around me that have input to define what that is uh, for a materiality assessment? And it links right back to what Jermaine was talking about. Indigenous uh, communities have a huge say when you have that duty to consult, what's important to them, how does it align with what is important to you? It's it's actually a great explanation, by the way. Um, <laughs> um, but what is, okay, again, try not to boil the ocean. So let's, is, are there a couple I don't know if it's trend. I, that's the thing with this, some of this, these things. I don't know if it's trend or if it's um, like it's still kind of ESG is still fairly new. So is there sort of the leading factors like if a company is is going forward with something or or developing a project, there's a few out of each of the buckets that just need to be addressed right out. Like they just have to. It, it's it's part of the environment that they're in. Yeah, and it's fascinating because we're talking about where is this coming from? What are the trends that we're starting to see? Yes, there are industry agnostic topics that everybody has to address. You can't get away from diversity, equity, and inclusion. You need to have it addressed at your board label or table and across your management group. If you're impacting Indigenous communities, you have to have that duty to consult. And, and when we look at the duty to consult, it's not a well, did I talk to an indigenous community? Great, I got their input, we're moving forward with our project. This is an enduring relationship that has an impact on, yes, ownership uh, of indigenous communities within major capital projects as well. Where we're seeing some unique differences is this whole environment of even, if you just pull out one of the drivers of accessing capital, and you referred to that in the introduction to this, this session, the ability to access capital is changing under this whole guise of sustainable yeah. finance, you know, the yeah. principles for responsible banking. And you look at banks across Canada, you look at banks around the world, they're all committing to it. And what comes with it is this whole commitment of, well, I need to hit net zero financed emissions by 2050. And in order to do that, I'm adjusting where I'm going to lend and to who I'm going to lend and the cost of that lending. And some banks are even getting to the point where they're cutting out certain industries and sectors. I would say bigger trending from that is the idea of we're in this environment of it, it's voluntary basis for disclosures, but we're seeing more mandatory disclosure requirements that are coming up right. against organizations. And we're trying to say with the world of ESG uh, frameworks and standards around you, don't wait for that ball to come and crush you. Now's the time to get in front of it of, 
well, what is right now voluntary? What are our topics? If we had to go mandatory, how would we even have the information to report on it? Could we even uh, give an accurate statement of where you're at today? Similar to what Jermaine was saying about t- getting communicating with the indigenous communities before you do a, a press release like that. That's just the same idea. Don't don't just go to the checkbox because by the time you're done to get to the bottom of your checkbox, they might have already added three more things. Yeah. And, and that's where I was making a note while Jermaine was talking. This whole idea of proactive or reactive, they're both strategies. Right. One is always more preferential than the other. I would rather get in front of something to say, how do we have an influence and ability on the relationship itself to move something forward positively? Because that positive is being rewarded by other stakeholders who are saying, I want to do business with you. I want to lend to you. I'm an investor that wants to allocate my capital to you because I believe in the model of what you're trying to achieve. That is gaining huge grounds versus the, oh, 90% of uh, those who are listed on the SEC, uh, they have to have a report. I guess we have to have a report. So let's grab a GRI standard, a global uh, you know, reporting yeah. initiative, get something on, on, on paper, and it looks more like a color by numbers exercise versus a real value add. Yeah, well, there's a there's something I wanted to ask is um it's uh, is for instance on the social side, and I'll I'll try not to butcher this question um, because I think it's an important one. There's a debate going on that's probably going to continue on to the end of time. Um, you know, equality of opportunity, equality of outcome. So if you're a, co- a large corporation and you lean more towards um, equality of opportunity that might not align with your funding streams. So our companies, is there room for companies to have different strategies that will still appease the, 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 the funding and what they need, the opportunities they need to develop, or is it, or is it a pretty tight box that they have to play in? Or can they come out with, can they be a little outside the box and still have a good, on a, a, a strategy that still, that still gets the green light, if, if I'm asking that question right. I don't know if I... I yeah, I hear what you're asking, Jared, and, and this is where it's fascinating. You can have a perspective of, if I just need to comply, what do we need to do, make it go away? Well, all right. you've done is added a compliance exercise to your risk management profile yeah. as an organization, and that's as far as it's gonna go. But what you've missed in this is you've missed the actual value proposition of saying, how do I redefine what I do? So yes, I'm sustainable. Investors want to know that I'm here as an organization in in perpetuity. We're not talking about you're gone in 10 years time. Pension funds themselves are looking for the right opportunities of investing in you because they need to ensure for pensioners over the long term that there's still value added returns. So to me, strategy is a strategy. You can take a compliance that's fine, but it's going to translate into more risk as you mature down this path. A really great opportunity, since you were asking examples of Jermaine, and and you you will know about this, is the whole idea of Gibson Energy and Bank of Montreal. When the two of them came together, you had sustainable finance from BMO saying, we have to influence change in in those who we're doing business with. And you have Gibson who is saying on the other side, well, we have commitments that we want to achieve. They brought it together and said, well, out of my $750 million uh, revolving uh, facility, Let's build in sustainability metrics. So if we achieve those metrics, BMO gives an actual translated value back to uh, Gibson Energy. That is the incentive for doing this. It's not just BMO saying, you know, I've got a billion dollars that I want to allocate across circular economy, green tech, and, uh, you know, clean tech. This is about influencing change. So if you think about it as a value driver, you don't want to just do compliance. You want to say, how do I change how I do business with the stakeholders around me like banks? Right. And can and, and in that example, can companies then, can they also influence change to get ahead of the curve as well? Can they, are they getting listened to to say, hey, we've developed this strategy and, and now this now this can become industry standards? Yeah, the great part about where industry, and this is all about influencing change. So really, when you talk about circular economies, you're looking at plastic yeah. waste and you know recycling. But there is a circular economy globally that everybody, if they're taking the mentality of passing on an influence to make change, that cascades down the entire supply chain. So who you acquire goods from, how are you influencing sustainability and contracts with them? 
if you are looking at natural resource consumption, how are you protecting it and ensuring those who do business with you are protecting it at the same time? All of this comes together in a strategy that isn't a, a stop as bookends on either side of your company. Yeah. It extends far out in terms of your supply chain. And where? what about Canada, though, uh, specific to the Canadian market? Uh, of course, there's this glow. I mean, ESG is a global thing as well. So where does sort of Canada stand? And I, I think a two part to that question, where does Canada stand on the regulatory side of it? But also, where should the business leaders, you know, I'm talking about the C-level executives, what do they need to be sort of setting up? What, what are the steps that they need to take uh, based on the, the environment that Canada is in? It's, it's interesting where we're at in Canada. So I sit on the CPA Canada Sustainability Reporting Council, and we're looking at changes that are coming globally to Canada and using Canada's voice to influence abroad. But we're not quite at the point of uh, the UK they're working towards their net zero commitments as a country and are mandating uh, reporting across the economy and they're setting 2025 as a date. So there's the mandatory side. 2025. Not there yet. <laughs> that's, that's quick. So if you look at it here at home uh, in addressing the E of ESG, the Canadian securities administrators, they did create guidance in 2019 and it, it helps companies in disclosing information around climate risk. But it's amazing how many are saying that didn't go far enough. And just uh, this year, uh, this is a mouthful, but the Ontario Capital Markets Modernization Task Force, let's just call it the task force, they called for an overhaul of Canada's securities regulator. And they said, among many things being requested, you got to have more stringent climate related reporting requirements. So if you're publicly listed, the influences on minimum expectations will continue to grow and it will become more of a mandatory requirement. So that, that's just to give you a little bit of an idea on the E. Uh, on, on the S side for social, we do have a broadened scope of directors and officers uh, a duty of loyalty. And this is that when acting honestly in good faith with a view to the best interests of the, of the corporation itself, this now includes consideration of the environment and the interest of stakeholders, which is what went way beyond shareholders to now include Stake. employees and retiring or retirees, pensioners, creditors, uh, consumers and governments. And if you look at the timeline, this goes back to a decision by the Supreme Court in 2008. And then we saw the Business Corporations Act change to encompass this in 2019. Um, if, if you look at the governance pillar, January 1st of 2020, the Canada Business Corporation Act also required corporations to disclose diversity in boards and senior management. So do I see this as a limitation on the changes? This is all that's happened. And that's all that's going to be there. There's a lot more that's coming. So considering mandatory, considering the opportunities to drive value, this is where organizations and senior leadership teams with the board really need to put on the hat what is ESG to me? What are the topics that are most critical? Of those topics, what are we doing to address it today? And of what we're doing, there's likely gaps. How do we ensure we're proactively addressing those and making it a part of our strategy and driving it as part of the DNA, the culture of our organization? So it doesn't matter when a mandatory comes, you're already doing it. It's already good practice and you're already responding to that environment. So uh, again, this is, and that's fine. It's a business show. So we, we plug people all the time, <laughs> but, a, but a legitimate question of where does m &P come into this? Because there's all these stages. I mean, I'm sure every stage you're contributing, contributing, but it, I mean, I guess what it comes down to is because your ear to the, is to the ground with all of this, it's sort of the sooner you're talking and outlining those things, updating the trends, where the market's going, trying to get it. So it's not just a checkbox. You're actually getting out ahead of these policies. I guess the earlier, the better is what it's going to come down to, right? Yeah, ab absolutely. In fact, uh, I'm happy you asked the question because it is one of my favorite topics. But when we look at this and you know that you're only getting exposure right now, there's Jermaine and there's myself. So we're bringing the duty to consult and the sustainability together. We've got this multidisciplinary approach to solutions for our clients that cover all of our different lines of service. And we usually check where's that organization at to align with what they need to do next. Because it is it is a maturity. It is a roadmap. There are yeah. waypoints that you need to get to. So if you ask questions like, 
Are you challenged with addressing your current diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy? Well, look, we can help you with that. We can benchmark. We can look at what your peers are doing. We can construct and provide a strategy for how you build that out and get insight into your organization. If, if you just want a maturity assessment, we think we're doing a good job. What can you do to assess? Are we really mature or not? Having an independent come in to evaluate what you're doing really adds a lot of value because you may be overestimating your capabilities and your ability to deliver on what your sustainability targets are. And you might even be an organization that's saying, hey, we're all the way down this path. We're reporting on sustainability topics. We want somebody as an independent to come in and validate. I want you to verify and provide an opinion. Is this complete and accurate? It's the same mentality as if you were to look at a set of financial statements you have the audit opinion, or well, you're gonna eventually need an opinion on your sustainability reporting too. We can help evaluate, how did you go about your process? Are the right controls there? Is there data integrity? Did you do your right calculations correctly? It's all of that that comes in. So um, I'm gonna take a page from Jermaine's playbook here. I'm gonna say it depends on, on where we get involved, but it's very dependent upon your, your maturity level of your ESG program. I want to go back to actually, I'm going to bring Jermaine back in and have a question to both of you. When you come in at these early stages in both your, in both where you specialize, um, when you come in in those early stages, how educated are the companies? How prepared are they? Um, I mean, I, I remember even, even five years ago, there was just a, it was sort of a lost puppy look. And I mean, I'm talking to, I, I was talking to people that were, I mean, they were, way up the food chain as, as far as, and they still, there was a, you know, they could talk about it at a high level, but it was very unspecific. Are you, do you still, are you still running into that? Or do you find and to both of you in your field, are companies, Jermaine, we'll start with you. Are they, are they better educated on it now? Or, or is there still a lot of, for lack of a better word, handholding that has to go in when you come in on that early stage? I would say that, um, Companies that have developed large projects yeah. tend to have much more maturity in this space because um, whether they've done it because they're very invested in it and want to do it or they had to do it, um, they've gone through a large scale approval process, which has required them to do this. I, I think where um, companies that are at um, doing smaller projects, like let's say drilling or things that tend to not have larger approvals are, are struggle more with what to do, what the expectations are, why, yeah. why they're doing it. Yeah. I was going to ask that actually. And I think, um, again, I'll, I'll keep both of you in for this, this answer is the one I'm, I've got a, you know, we have some massive companies on this show, but I come from the small business world and I love small businesses. So I'm unapologetically biased on the topic because I'd like to see small, well, small businesses do well. And I think it helps across the board. Does it sometimes give an unfair advantage to the large companies who have the money to throw at it? They can do all the research, you know, they can bring in lead consultants and they can do all these things. And the smaller companies, it, it's much more difficult for them. Is that, is that a legitimate concern that we can have? I, I think that's fair in the sense that um, it, it does play out like that, where to um, to have a six, typically successful or well-established Indigenous engagement program, um, you need capacity internally in your organization, and you also need to be providing capacity to those that you are engaging with. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, Indigenous groups largely do not receive sufficient capacity funding from government to um, participate in these types of major processes. So right. when companies are small and are struggling to kind of with capacity, both on their own side, as well as capacity asks that are coming to them, um, it is much more challenging to have a um, fulsome process and a meaningful process. Even if the intentions are good, that's that's the thing. The, the intention will be good, but just the process is not in place. Potentially, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and I think there you know, can be, like I said, a, a lot of misunderstanding sometimes about the why, like why why is a company doing this? Why is it why is it different or perhaps have a higher bar or a threshold than um, your public engagement or your DE&I strategy with other 
um, groups or organizations? Like why is indigenous consultation a specific requirement? Why is it different? Um, and, and why does it need to be paid attention to in a way that is, is somewhat unique? And so I think there's an understanding piece that sometimes is missing as well. Yeah. Karen, it's yeah, please. If I could add to that too, here, yes. here's the one thing, if I could, regardless of size, every company has the same level of accountability. Like you can't from small to large say you don't care about the health and safety of your employees. Right. That you always have to do and you always have to address and you're going to have to report on those statistics. But now bring into the social pillar modern day slavery. You as a smaller organization may not be exposed to that in your supply chain, but as a bigger global entity, because you're purchasing uh, from a, a wider um, uh, array of suppliers around the world, it's something you have to address. So there's there's a maturity here as topics come across the table uh, where I find that some organizations say, oh, we're too small. We don't want to address it is when you get into the emissions side of scope one and two, large and small say, yeah, we can nail down scope one and two. But I don't want to address scope three because it's the whole supply chain that's too difficult to find. So sometimes even the large should be doing scope three, but they're cutting it off. So yeah. it's a bit of the both ends looking at this. Accountability is the same. You just might be exposed to different topics based on how large you are and how many right. jurisdictions or countries you cover. Yeah. But, but that, now that, with, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, go no, ahead. I was going to say that just made me think of, of something that we um, sort of touched on at the beginning, and, and this kind of brings it back a little bit. Um, I, I don't know if people have seen recently, there's a, a major court decision that came out uh, from Northeast BC with the Blueberry River First Nations winning um, a case about a infringement on their treaty rights from cumulative effects of projects. Mm. And so essentially what they won was the idea that the government has approved not just big projects, but big projects, little projects, <laughs> all sorts of things that have together in a combined way right. caused an impact that is um, too big to the nation's ability to exercise their treaty rights. And so projects, whether they're big ones or little ones, are on hold in that claim area until BC and the nation can negotiate a path forward and a way to manage those cumulative impacts. So little players are now being brought into this, whether um, they have that capacity or not, because the cumulative effects argument is, is now saying it's not just your, your little well by itself, might not do a lot. And that's kind of been the dialogue and discourse to date is, well, it's just one little thing. Um, this case is saying it doesn't matter if it's the one little thing, it's all the little things together with all the other things. But now on the MNP side, are you able, because you're, you're such a large organization and you have, um, you're, you're part of both these big companies on the indigenous side, on the big energy, in the big, the big energy companies, all these customers and, and collaborations you have, are you able to help those small companies uh, in a maybe in a way they don't even need the help? Um, if I could jump in there really quick, we know if you're like contextualizing right now, the big guys, there's many commitments they're making. And if you go down that supply chain, you'll find those smaller companies that are saying, wait, how are they asking me for an ESG or sustainability framework? I don't even know what it is in the first place. Yeah. We're helping to translate the Greek of here's what they're asking to what yeah. you do today to allow you to move forward without throwing down a significant portion of money. We're helping almost being the interpreters to bring, here's what it means. This is what you should be doing. Here's what you're already doing that helps you fill some of the gaps. Here's what you need to do moving forward so you can be compliant because we realize you're small and you don't have unlimited budget and yet the game is changing. And if you don't follow the rules, you're likely to see changes to what your revenue sources are. So there's sort of two parts of this is if you're um, like you said on the, that recent decision, I just forgot the name of it, um, where it's accumulative, where you one small drill isn't a big deal. Uh, one small well isn't a big deal. But when you put it all together, it's a problem. Do they one question is, do they have a lot of recourse in that situation or do they sort of just have to wait till the whole thing gets resolved and then and then sort of go through their check, the checklist that's provided? And then can small companies, if they're coming into it, they need to be having these discussions before the project even gets started. Sort of a two-part. I'll, I'll hand it over to whoever wants to sort of take that. Um, so, I mean, new projects, new new things are um, on hold until a process is uh, figured out. Right. And so there will have to be some modifications that will likely be coming Uh 
for approvals in that area. Um, existing projects will likely, you know, continue on, but oh, okay. those that are looking at building new, expanding, um, perhaps relicensing that that type of activity uh, will need to be considered in the new framework that's going to be negotiated between uh, the province and the nation. And do you think it will be, I mean, obviously you don't, you don't, <laughs> you don't have a crystal ball for it, but do you think it will be something that the smaller operators along with the uh, larger ones can still competitively uh, start their projects? Will they get a checklist that is, is, is a, is a doable, doable thing for them? I, yeah. I don't think I could answer that. I just know that um, they will have to comply with whatever is put forward. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to watch. I hopefully uh, when it sort of gets forward, it'd be interesting to have you, have you back on to sort of unpack it and sort of see those steps. I'm sure it'll, cause it'll, it'll cover both the ESG side and the indigenous relations side, obviously. Um, so Jermaine, I want to kind of sort of, as we come to a close of this, this interview, um, sort of circle it back to Alberta. I mean, Alberta is it's affecting the the entire country, but just sort of bring it back home to that is how much because Alberta's recovery plan and moving forward, how much does do they as a province need to start both both government and and companies need to think about that sort of that that cumulative effect and that sort of approach? How, how much of a key is that going to be? Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think it's 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 going to be um a really crucial thing to pay attention to or continue to pay attention to or pay more attention to, um, you know, both the, the new federal legislation is, is being triggered in Alberta quite frequently yeah. on major projects. Um, the federal government absolutely has a focus on cumulative effects and sustainability. Um, their new impact assessment act is, is probably really tied to a lot of the things Ed has been talking about. It's based on the World Bank standards. Yeah. Um, so it is it is looking at all of those things um, and projects are being designated under federal legislation, um, despite Alberta you know, not being thrilled about that, which people may have seen in the news, sort of Kenny, um, you know, mentioning that Alberta would challenge some of that federal legislation and, and that it was sort of federal overreach. Um, so that's something to absolutely pay attention to, as well as if we, kind of bring it back to the discussion around the blueberry decision and the um, where the courts had said the province was not managing lands and resources to allow for the continued exercise of blueberries treaty and Aboriginal rights. And so, um, you know, Alberta is also covered by treaties, um, historic treaties, the, you know, treaty number eight, where blueberry one uh, continues throughout uh, the northern portion of Alberta. Um, and Alberta has a lot of the same kind of management challenges in terms of all of the different projects being approved. So this type of um, scenario could absolutely um, be comparable to places uh, in the province of Alberta. And so I think companies kind of proactively looking at managing cumulative impacts, um, perhaps looking at offsetting um, reclamation activities, things like that, that help that management of those potential impacts, looking at their project development plans as a whole, uh, rather than some of those one-offs. I, I could honestly say I wish I was more of a, an expert because I feel like I could unlock a lot more <laughs> because of what you know on the subject. Um, but uh, but Ed, I think uh, I, I kind of want to wrap it up with with your your answer on another question is for this Alberta specific that Alberta recovery plan. How proactive does Alberta need to be on the ESG side, regardless of if they agree or, or not with it? I mean, we've all seen the news, so we, we know where the, that conflict is. But, um, you know, it, it's it, it's probably more of a delay than, uh, than, than, than them putting a stop to it. So how proactive do they need to be realistically? Jared, a recovery is predicated on capital. And we know in today's world that access to capital is coming with more strings. And those strings we can wrap up in much of the uh, ESG discussion that we just, we we scraped the surface on today. So if you know you need capital and we want a strong recovery and we need to build for that recovery, you need to know, is my, if I just took business as usual, is my access to capital getting harder and harder? And are those sources starting to dwindle? Because if they are, 
you've put your recovery on a path that will ultimately fail. Right. At the end of the day, what we want is take advantage. We know there are global movements. It's even in Canada. The whole idea we talked about earlier around sustainable finance, the idea that sustainable finance will drive conditions for you to access capital that have to be more than just a statement that's on a piece of paper in a report. It's got to be meaningful. It's got to be actionable. It has to be measurable. And it has to be this commitment that's saying, here's what we're doing different to drive a sustainability strategy that allows third parties to say, I see what you're doing. You're on the right path. I'm rewarding you. Here's access to capital. Yeah. So if we could, I'll tie it back that way. Yeah, it's uh, you know, and what came to my mind is I think um, there's a there's a movie. Oh, sorry, there's a movie um, where the the character says it's it's what people do. It's find someone to blame, and in this environment, it is it's sort of understanding the source as well. You know, you might see the the front line that the news might say it's a on the federal level, but the federal level is also being affected by world banks the, glo- the the global economy as well it's not just a matter of it's not just someone went into a room and said oh this is the way we're going to do things their understanding as a country that there's there's the global <laughs> parts that are, are working and that's in sort of trickle in federally and then provincially and then right down to the companies so it's it's an interesting perspective and i think it's an important one to understand or else it's easy to get lost and you start sort of focusing on the wrong source of the challenge um, that was my statement. I'm sorry. There was no question that came up. Well, <laughs> no, I just found it. It's, it, it is interesting though, hearing you talk about it, Ed, is because I do think when I hear a lot of the conversations, and I guess I will turn this into a question to wrap up, is do you hear confusion? Both of you, as I promise this will be the last question of the show. Do you hear confusion about where, where the challenges are coming from? Uh, if I could start, Jermaine, hopefully you're okay with me jumping in. The world isn't helping itself right now because there's confusion around frameworks and standards. Everybody's being measured in a different formulaic approach and everybody's trying to understand, tell me the minimum threshold of where I need to get to in order to embrace sustainability. And then there are those who are going way beyond, how do I embrace sustainability to strategically differentiate or to pivot or to make a change vision about what I do as business today? So wherever you're at on this spectrum, there is confusion that's being driven by these large frameworks and standards. Yeah. There's confusion around, well, what should be important and how do I approach it? And then there's confusion around, well, once I get that handful of key topics, those ESG topics, what type of, what type of strategic goal or outcome am I trying to achieve? Because it's one thing to measure where you're at. It's another to say, where do you want to be in two, three, 10? Yeah, years? yeah. And what, and what about for you, Jermaine? Is it, is it similar? Is there still, is there that confusion of sort of where do we even, where, where is the standard? Where do we start? You know, that just that sort of thing. I think sometimes, absolutely. Um, I, I think Ed was able to provide a, a really fulsome answer there. Uh, and I would just say, I, I agree. There's absolutely um, still remains confusion about um, what, what a good consultation process looks like um, and how, what I, I think oftentimes it's thought of as you go through the, you know, you meet, you share information, you meet some more and share some more information and, and it's very process driven. Um, right. But what some of the recent court direction has been is it's not really as much like process is important, of course, but it's not process without substance isn't going to get you anywhere. And right. so um, just going through the motions without any meaningful change or any meaningful um, input from those that you are consulting with will not um, is not a good process. <laughs> so, yeah. so if you're not doing anything with what you're hearing, you're not doing a good job. And I think people get really caught up on the doing without the responding. So it's the yeah. It's the do something with what you heard. It's accommodate for those outstanding impacts, mitigate what um, what those cumulative effects are. So it's the do something that um, I think often gets missed. Yeah. Both of you, thank you for coming on the show. I, um, you know, it's, it, we've done, we haven't done this specific type of show before, but we've, we've sort of skirted around it in different angles and it always gets a lot of engagement because there is 
you know, you can, there is a lot of technology out there. There are a lot of processes that are being proposed and sensors and all types of things. But at the end of the day, you do need capital for everything. <laughs> so um, thanks for coming on and sort of unpacking it and, and and sort of walking us through it. It's it's very interesting. I hope we get to do it again and maybe drill down into some specific verticals and to do some more examples. I, I think it'll, there'll be a lot of interest from our audience. So thank you. Thanks, Jared. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, keep recommending guests. We have got a lot of people um, across, well, Canada and booking people out of the U.S., um, helping us keep continuing to build our lineup of shows. There's so much to cover. The more we cover, the more that there is to. So thank you for all your support. Please keep suggesting guests. Follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook um, and, and subscribe on YouTube. There'll be links to the description if you're watching it to be able to, uh, to do all that. Thank you for MNP for being a, a huge supporter of the show. They're they're helping, they're supporting us on Crownsman A, Crownsman Energy, the Crownsman Show. It's just been fantastic. And uh, please check out some of their services and we'll have all the links to that as well. Thank you. And see you on the next episode of the Crownsman Show. <laughs>